We're so glad that you could make the time to be here. Uh, my wife and I, Sarah, we were away last week, so it is good to be back. Uh, we only missed one week. We're actually away for our 15-year uh, wedding anniversary. And um, thank you, some woos. That's nice. And so anyway, yeah, we were away. We had a, a great weekend and uh, just down at Apollo Bay, just relaxing. It's the first time we've been able to, to get away. It's actually kind of crazy when we think about it that 15 years has come and gone. It feels like it's gone so quick, right? Correct answer. So it feels like it has, has gone so quick. I actually remember uh, when, we were, when we were newlyweds, just after we had got married, uh, we came back to church and I, someone came up to us. I don't know if anybody's ever said this to you, but someone came up to us and they said, oh, so you're married now. You've just come back from your honeymoon. We're like, yeah. And they said, so what are you going to do? You're going to take a year off? And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're going to take a year off. I said, what are you talking about? Has anybody ever said this to you? you? Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. It's this, it's this weird thing that Christian people say sometimes when they haven't read their Bibles properly, and, and they say stuff like this, and, and they say, yeah, yeah, it's biblical to take a year off after you got married. I said, where does it say that? They were like, I don't know, it's in there somewhere. So I said, oh, wait, I'm going to find out where it actually says that. You flick back to Deuteronomy, and it does say something kind of like that, but you got to twist it, right? So, so I read what it actually said. You know, it said, when Israel have been sent to war, and if you have just got married, you don't need to join the army for the first year. And I was like, I did a quick review. Hey, we look back over our lives. Well, hey, we're, we're not part of Israel, and we actually haven't gone to war. Not that I know about, you know. So, so I was like, so you know what I think we're going to do? We're just going to get involved, and we're just going to serve, and we're just going to, you know. In fact, the truth is, right, after we got married, I think we got more involved at that point, which was probably the best thing we could have done for our marriage, because, you know, we're in this together, you know, and, and, and I think that was the best thing that we could do, right? Why did we do that? Because we love the church. You know, we do. I'm like, thank you, Mom, but we love the church. We do. We love it, right? Right. We just loved getting involved and serving and being part of it. Like, honestly, I'll tell you the truth, right? So, so I was just so glad as I started to think back about my church experience. I'm so glad that there just happened to be a church service running on the weekend that God convicted me in my heart of where I was. And I was able to just walk straight into a church that day and listen to someone that was preaching the word. Some team was up there and leading people in worship. And I just kind of walked in and had recommitted my life to Jesus. I'm just, thank God the church was open, right? And if I think back about church and just my experience, man, this thing called the church has totally transformed not only uh, who I am, but also what I do with my life and my time. And gosh, like, you know, for Sarah and I, boy, we have done, I, I think, nearly every job that exists in the church, right? So, so you know, I, I have done the jobs where people stand on the road and hold the sign and say, welcome to church, right? I, I have done that job. And uh, gosh, I've, I've, uh, I've stood at the doors and just welcomed people as they came in. And to be honest, I was terrible at that job. Everybody that came in, I just wanted a deep and meaningful conversation with them, right? They just wanted to get in and get their coffee. I was just blocking their way. But anyway, this is the thing, right? So, so anyway, I, I did that. Uh, gosh, I was the young adults pastor for a little while. I, I, I did that job. We've been involved in missions. Wow, we ran small groups for like years and years. And it's like... Uh, just tried to invest into people. The truth is, we have just been involved in church for so many years because we love it. But, you know, I think somehow, I did all this stuff, right? And somehow, I don't know, like I just, like I just ended up here, right? And I think that all the stuff that I did back then actually helped prepare me for what I'm doing now. And I don't think I would have the maturity to do now anything that I'm currently doing if I didn't start all the way back then. We are in a series about developing maturity in Christ. It's about how you can grow in Christ and become a, a more mature believer. And we're calling this series Christian Essentials. What are the essential things that you could be doing or should be doing that will actually help transform you spiritually and see you grow and develop? I want to read a scripture to you. It comes to us out of John 21, verse 15 to 17. Jesus has died, 
and has been resurrected and he is on the beach with Peter. Peter has just caught, for the record, 100 and 53 fish. You don't need to know that. It's just interesting that they mentioned it. So it says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And I was like, more than what? So I looked into it. Nobody knows. Yeah, like biblical experts, people, commentators, people that read the scriptures, right? Nobody knows. We don't know what Jesus was talking about. No one knows, right? Well, I tried to imagine the situation. Where is Peter, right? He's, he's on the beach. He's got 153 fish. You know, we know he's counted them. So it's like, you know, do you love me more than these? <laughs> you know, is he talking about the fish, right? Like, Peter, do you love me more than the fish? And you think, that's a weird thing for Jesus to ask. Well, I don't know if he was actually saying that, right? But what's the fish? Well, I don't know, like breakfast, apparently. What's the fish? Maybe the fish for him is just money, right? Because what does Peter do with fish? He sells it and he gets money. So maybe that's the way that he, he makes his living. So it's Peter, let's just, just, let's just do a, a, the old switcheroo. So Peter, do you love me more than you love money? Or maybe what he was really saying is, you know, I know you love fishing, Peter. How many of you love fishing, right? So, so Peter, do you love me more than fishing? Well, that was his job. What's your job? I know that you get a lot of meaningful work. Hopefully, you love your job and, and you get a lot out of it. But, but do you love your job more than you love Jesus? There's a bunch of disciples around at the time as well. They're all, they're all standing around. Maybe the question that Jesus was asking is, hey, do you love me more than the other disciples love me? I doubt he probably said that, but I, I think that Jesus is really asking him some specific questions. And it's worth considering, like, where is Jesus in the priorities of your life? How much does your life really center around him and who he is and what he says to you and what he asks you to do? Do you love other things more than him? Is he crowned and seated on the throne of your heart? Where is Jesus in reference to all of the busyness and the activities and the priorities? And we know more than any other century, gosh, we are busy. Peter, do you love me more than these? We're thinking about. He says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, well, feed my lambs. Well, Let's sort the sheep from the goats. When he talks about his lambs, who's he talking about? That would be the church, okay? So his lambs are his church, right? So what is he saying? He says, feed my church. Help grow my church. Help develop my church. I want you to begin to preach and speak to my church. And, and then he says to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says to him, yes, Lord, like, we just did this, you know? Like, yes, I, I love you. And so Jesus hears that, and he says to him, you know, uh, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend to my sheep. And then in verse 17, he says to him the third time, and this, you know, this is starting to sting. Simon, son of John, do you really love me? Do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time, do you love me? And he says to him, Lord, you know everything. Come on, like, you know that I love you. And Jesus says to him a third time, feed my sheep. Look after, look after the church. I mean, how many of you know that when Jesus says something twice, he really means it? Boy, when he says something third time, you, you really better, you better get this, you know? When I read this and I, I see really what's going on in, in the text here is Peter is having a conversation with Jesus where Jesus is saying, do you love me? And he's saying, well, out of that, you got to do something. i got to tell you, I've seen people and their behaviors be transformed by how much they love Jesus. It just changes people. I don't know if you've ever, how many of you have heard of a guy called Ian McCormack? He's an amazing story, an incredible story. And I, I, I know him, we've, we've spoken and spent time together. And you know, Ian McCormack, just for those of you that wouldn't know, like, he, he had lived a relatively selfish life. All he wanted to do was live the dream, travel and surf. And, you know, just, he actually died. He got stung by a jellyfish and he died. And right before he gave, uh, or he died, he gave his life to Jesus. He tried to say a prayer. You know, he, he didn't get any of the words right. But I love that God is so gracious that he understood what he was trying to get at. And he just accepted that as the prayer, you know. And so, you know, here he is and he, he actually does die and he goes to heaven and he meets Jesus. And I'm going to skip over some of the details. But here is uh, uh, Ian McCormack standing before Jesus 
And Jesus says to him, hey, I want you to look after all the people. You're gonna, I'm going to want to send you back to earth. And, and, and you know, you're going to have a ministry and you're going to touch people's lives. And he says that he turned around and he saw this sea of people, right? Uh, uh, I mean, gosh, he was bold because he turned back towards Jesus and he said, yeah, I don't care about them. <laughs> I don't care about those people. And Jesus says, like, that's bold, right? And Jesus says, yeah, but I do. And he's like, uh, he looks back and he sees some of his family and he's like, yeah, all right, well, all right, send me back, right? So, so he does. He actually wakes up in a morgue and someone, uh, they have the tag on his foot to say that he's dead. He's got the certificate of his death. Someone has a scalpel in the bottom of his foot and he wakes up, freaks them out, right? <laughs> And, and, and so I've met him, and this was many, many years ago, but I've met him. We've, we've had dinner. We've, we've spoken many times. I've got to tell you that no one loves people like Ian McCormack. Man, he's so good at doing it. He just loves people, but I realized that it didn't really start off like that for him. It's like a journey. He began by giving his life to Jesus, and it was progressively his heart began to change until he loved people more and more. And this is not some kind of unique phenomenon right? This happens. This happened to me. I remember when I went back into church, and uh, I guess it was over a, a period of time, I started to, it started to change me on the inside. It started to think more about just, you know, myself, and I started to think more about other people. In fact, in a really significant way, I remember being emotionally moved by the fact that people didn't know who Jesus was, and I thought, wow, this, all of this stuff matters, and i got to start to arrange my life around this. Like, honestly, to me, it was really weird to me, right, to the point where I remember one particular day, I said, boy, this is weird. Like, what is happening to me? Why am I changing? Like, why am I different? It was just that God was working through me. Now, the thing is, I told you, this is not unique. This is not strange. In fact, in one of the largest studies ever undertaken, they, they measured, you know, hundreds of thousands of Christians and, and got them to fill out surveys to really discover as much as we could possibly find out about spiritual growth and the impact of having Christ transform us on the inside. And this is the thing that they discovered. The more mature you are, the more you love people. The more spiritually mature you are, the more you love people. And it's not even people you know, it's just people. Like you just, you just love them. There's something that changes and shifts inside of you. And I understand that it's a journey to get there, but I think that there is an undeniable link between the love that you have for God and how you begin to love people. You couldn't not see this. It's just so obvious. And see, the thing about love is, well, it's just so practical, isn't it? Like love is something that you don't just hold inside your heart. You know, if you know anything about somebody, right, if you, you know what they love, like it just kind of bleeds through. Somebody loves something, it just comes out. You don't have to ask them about it. You, you know what people love. And, and so, you know, I, I think that for people, when they're growing in Christ, when, when they start, when they're, you know, spiritually immature, we'd say, you know, they're just starting out in this journey, trying to grow closer towards Christ. You know, what, what happens in their heart? And so people begin to pray and they say things to God like this. Oh, Jesus, I really love you. And he says, really, do you love me? You're like, yes, I do. And he goes, great, great. Could you love people and serve them? And you're like, no, no that's, you got me wrong. That's not what I said. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Like, uh, it's a little awkward for you, Jesus, but you misunderstand. You know, I thought you knew everything. No, no, Jesus, what I was really saying was, I love you. It's you that I love. Really? Do you really love me? Yes, I love you. Well, could you love people and serve them? God, this is so awkward. How can you not get this? I'm not talking about other people. I'm not talking about them. I don't love them. I just love you. Well, then, do you really love me? Do you really love me? Because if you really love me, then shouldn't you also love other people? I mean, it almost feels like God is sort of testing people. If you really love me, something about this should bleed through. When I, when I read the scriptures, you see what he's saying to Peter, right? You get that? Like the subtext? Do you really love me? Yeah. Well, come on. Love people. Begin to serve them. 
this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I look at how Peter's meant to be serving. Like, what does Peter do? He's an apostle. He had a preaching gift. So he uses that preaching gift to begin to serve the church. Right now, I don't know what your spiritual gift is, but I find it to be true that when you love God, shouldn't you use what he's given to you to serve other people? Isn't that exactly what he's really saying here? Like, I don't know what your ministry is or, your, or how you help. When we talk about ministry, ministry is really just how you help people, particularly in this area of spiritual growth. Let's, let's say that. So I don't know what God's gifted you with, and I don't know what he's called you to do, but I find it be, to be true that if you love him, you use that gift to serve other people. And I look at this, yo, you're quiet this morning, church. This is going to sting a little. It's okay. Jesus is not letting Peter give him some kind of superficial response. You see that, right? You see that he really, come on, can we go deep for just a minute? Thank you, Matt. I'm going to take that and run with it, right? Let's go deep for just a minute. No superficial answer. You ask a bunch of Christians, do you love Jesus? Yeah, of course. (laughs) I know the answer to that question, right? We love Jesus. We love him, right? Yeah, do you really love him? Yeah, of course. Like, I know what to say, right? Do you serve people? That's not what I meant. I meant that I just love Jesus. Well, do you really love him? That's a little deeper. Wait a minute. Do you really love him? Really? Do you really love Jesus? Oh, we know the answers. But if we love him... There should be something that we can see, something that begins to emerge and come out. You know, what does he say? Do you you really love me, Peter? Do you really? Yes, my gosh, this is embarrassing. Don't say it in front of the other disciples. Do you really? (laughs) Yes. Then feed my lambs. I think it's an inescapable truth that when you love God, you serve people. Come on, you, you don't, come on. You don't have to be an expert to see that in the text, right? You didn't even really need me to do this. You already knew that, right? You don't have to be a, a, a commentator or, or, you know, you just see it. It's, it's, it's so obvious. It's right there. Think about it. What, is it. what do we read in Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28? It says, but Jesus calling to them, his disciples, he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you, must be your what? Your what? Your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your? Now, that's an interesting word to use. Slave. Wow, this is Jesus speaking. And then he says in verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many, at a foundational level, our Savior said that he was a servant. Now, no student is above their master, amen? Our Savior, he said, at a fundamental level, at a basic level, he says, I'm a servant. Now, pop quiz, what do servants do? Yes! I mean, come on, that, I gave you that for free. You knew the answer to that. Some of you are like, oh, I don't know, you said, yeah. <laughs> serve and serve, that, that, that just makes sense. I, I think that the most mature attitude that you can develop as a Christ-centered person is when you arrive at a place where you say, this life is not about me. A couple of you are excited about this. Come on, is that not it? Like when we're Christ-centered, we realize that this life is not about me. It's not about my preferences. It's not about what I want. Now that's weird in the world that we live in, which is all about you, all about your preferences, all about what you want, your priorities. And in stark contrast to the culture of the world, the culture of the kingdom says, that's not how we do it. No wonder it's such a weird experience for people to walk into church. They say, it's all about me. We say, it's all about him. 
This is a backwards message and a selfie-centered culture that says, no, 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 it's all about my priorities. Come on, can we have a Christ-centric conversation today? Can we go a little bit deeper? What if I told you today that you were meant to take all of your priorities and actually arrange it around Him? That's what it would mean to be Christ-centered, right? Is if He was at the middle and you just changed everything to suit what He requested. You change everything, your time, your schedule, like what you do with your work or your free time. It's like, God, I can't give this up. Well, hang on a minute. Who's at the center of your life? I told you this would sting just a little bit. So Peter, armed with this truth, you know what he says? He goes, come on, well, let's do this then. He starts to gather people together so that he can do his ministry. And what does he gather together? He gathers together the the church. What is the church, right? Well, the, the word is ecclesia, and it actually means Jesus' called out ones, the called out community. Listen, you have been called out of the culture that you were in and been pulled into another completely separate culture where Christ is at the center. You've been asked by God to leave where you are and move to a different place in your heart and your spirit. You are the called out community of God. And so he gathers together the ecclesia, Jesus's people from all around the place that he can find them. And he starts to preach. But to be honest, when they started to get the church together, they didn't do such a good job. They kind of messed it. Well, they didn't mess it up, but they just could have done a better job. And you can read about it in Acts chapter 6 if you want, but what they started to do is, is, is Peter, here he is, and he's meant to be preaching the word, right? But they actually find themselves, the apostles, right? They start to discover, what are they doing? They're, they're actually serving people food. Hellenist speaking Jews, and, they, and, and they, they're starting to serve these people. They're starting to serve the widows, you know, food and that. And they're like, here's Peter going, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. I've got a sermon to preach in 15 minutes, and here I am serving food. It's a lot of mouths to feed, and I don't have the time to write a sermon. We'll just rely on the Spirit then, you know, God, what are we going to do? Like, uh, I, I, I need to study the Word of God. I don't have time for this. And then one of them has a bright idea, genius move. Gosh, why are we doing everything? So they said, well, hang on, let's, let's find some people that can serve. What do you really need to do that? A couple of arms, right? So, so they look for people with arms and they, and they find them, right? But the threshold is high. They say they had to be full of the Holy Spirit. They lay hands on them, laying hands on them to serve food. Come on, that's, that's unbelievable. So, so they, they lay hands on them and then they say, look, you guys feed people, make sure that everyone is, is fed and looked after, and we will turn our attention to the preaching of the word. Amazingly, when they did this, it said the church began to explode because now you don't have 20% of the people doing 80% of the work, which is often how it can be sometimes. Now they're just leveraging everything that they can. Come on, get involved, jump in, be part of what we're doing here so that we can preach the word to people and get saved and they get saved. And that, that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. And they, they, you know what? This is, this is what I like, would like to call organized. You know, this is the church decided that they were going to get organized. You ever see these weird people that walk around and say, I don't know about, you know, organized church, organized religion, right? I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you know what this would look like if it was disorganized? <laughs> Gosh, it would be a mess, right? Like, come on, what, what time does this thing start? I don't know. Let's just Let's just show up and see what happens. Island time. I, I don't know, right? What, what, how are we going to figure this out, right? Well, who's going to preach the word? I don't know. Well, you, you do it. I haven't prepared anything. I've been too busy serving food. Imagine, imagine if church was like that, a disorganized mess. Guys, trust me. Trust me. It's so much better when we're organized, right? So now what do they do? Well, they start to organize themselves in a very specific way. So they look at the different gifts, and we have what we call the office gifts. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. These are the office gifts, sometimes called the ascension gifts. And they take these gifts, right, and they arrange themselves. These people are often the ones that are preaching the word or leading churches. Actually, all five of them should be in a church. It's great when you can find a scenario like that. And so here they are, and they start doing all the things that they're supposed to do. But guys, there are so many more gifts that people have. And when you look in the scripture, get this, this is real, right? There is a, a gift just called service. We don't know what that means. It just means everything, right? If you got the gift of service, I want to know about it, right? Because you don't really know what it is either. So we'll just give you anything, you know? You've got the gift of service. Amen. Praise the Lord. Like, let's get you moving, right? 
So they got the gift of service, guys. What else have they got? Uh, the gift of exhortation, right? So when you are exhorting, you're like, you know, lifting praises to God. You, you don't have to. Listen, you don't have to be on platform to exhort Jesus. Amen. All right. So what are they? the gift of contributing? What are we talking about? Well, wealth and resource, to be honest, money. There are some people that are actually really gifted at raising resource and investing it into the church so that they can do what they were supposed to be doing. And so we see that. There's the gift of leadership, gift of mercy. What do we see? We see an alignment between people's skill set and the work that they do. Now, that's just smart. You do something that you're good at. Now, I have a theory, and it's, of course, it's only a theory, but I have a theory. If aliens arrived and, <laughs> and with no context, they didn't look at the few billion people that sit in church every week, but with no frame of reference, we gave them a Bible and they just opened it and we said, tell us about these people called Christians. I believe that they would arrive at a point where they'd say, these people serve. I mean, geez, look at it. They gave everything. It was almost like they centered their lives around Christ. It didn't matter whether it was money or skills or talents or abilities, right? Whatever they did, they made sure that Christ was at the center. And they were, they were so overcome by this passion and this desire to see the gospel go forth that they arranged their lives around this gospel message. Surely that's the conclusion that they would arrive at. I wonder, maybe we should arrive at the same conclusion. Here's what you should know. God says to people who love Him, serve my people. We're meant to be servants. This is a different message to what the world will tell you. Everything exists to serve you. Well, in church, we, we say it a little bit differently. We say, hey, we are here to serve people. We are here to help. We are here to minister. When you love God, you serve people, and that is how the kingdom of God advances on planet Earth. It just makes sense. You know, I, when I prepare a message, I don't just do it in isolation, right? I look at, the, I look at this, and I, and I think, to, I read the Word, and I go, well, you know, I know what it says, right? But I should pray into this. And, and so I did, and I said to God, I, God, what are we really asking people to do? What are we really asking people to do? What, what, do, you want, what do you want people to do? What, what would be great to come out of this, this weekend, I guess, this message that is your word to your church, right? And I felt God respond to me. You know what he said? He goes, come on now, I only need two fish. I, I only need two fish. I realized something about it. You, do you remember the story about a, a, a little boy, a nameless little boy who had hardly anything, but he put it in the hands of his Savior, and what happens? It multiplied, Right? And sometimes we think, oh, what have I got? I don't, I don't really have anything. But you don't know what happens when you go to work with the Holy Spirit. Amen. You don't know what happens when you take the little thing that you've got and you put it in the hands of your Savior. right? Sometimes the small things are just part of a much larger picture of something that God is doing in other people's lives. You don't even know the multiplication or the flow and effect that you have from doing your small little thing. Do you know that over the past two weeks, we have had people just show up to church and, and because we had somebody standing at the top of a driveway with a sign, and they just smiled and waved it. And believe it or not, in this busy world, these people had nothing to do. So they're driving past, and literally the conversation in the car was, what are we doing for the next few hours? I don't know. You want to go check it out? Which they did, and gave their lives to Jesus. I mean, this... And we say, oh, what is it really? It's just one little thing, like sitting there with a sign. Yeah, but that's when you partner with the Holy Spirit. This is what happens when God begins to move in people's lives. And so to me, it just makes sense that we should give God what we have and let Him bless it. You know, 122 years ago, Charles Spurgeon stood before his church and he said this exact thing to them. He said, we can serve God in the outward acts we perform. That is the highest form of service. If we do not serve God thus, we do not really serve Him at all. When we serve, we act. We do something. It's self-evident. You know, I, I remember many years ago, 
I, I met with somebody, it was just a passing conversation really, but there were a person at our church, this is many years ago, and they said, oh, I just don't know what I'm, like, I want to do something, I want to, you know, get involved, maybe serve, I don't know. I said, well, would you consider yourself to be a mature Christian? And this person said, yes, I, I think I'm a mature Christian. I said, are you interested in serving the needs of the church? And she was like, what are you talking about? I said, well, the truth is, is that if you're a mature Christian, you've got all these people that are like, you know, maybe babies in Christ or exploring Christ. They're just wanting to grow and, and, you know, they're just wanting to develop. So, you know, what would be really great, what the church really needs is if you could just lead a small group. And she goes, oh, been there, done that. I was like, are you serious? I, is this a joke? Is there a camera around here? What are you talking about? Been there, done what? Discipleship? Like, like, well, like, this is what we do. What do you mean, been there, done that? Ah, I've done discipleship. We don't need to really focus on that. That's what we do. What do you, when does anyone mature to the point where they go, I'm over discipleship? This is the mission of of the church to help disciple people. I I tell you the truth, I couldn't believe it. And it occurred to me that maturity can't just be about your beliefs. I wouldn't be shocking if there was a bunch of people walking around saying, I'm a mature Christian, but they're not actually doing anything. They're not serving. They're not contributing, right? And thinking they're, they're mature. I just don't know if that even works. Why? Because love acts. Love does, Bob Goff would say, we do something out of who we are. I told you this message would sting. Listen to this. In the the largest study ever conducted on Christians all around the world, right? And and they, they, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of Christians. They discovered that the majority of Christ-centered mature Christians serve in their church once a month. I know. Once a month. Why? Because Christ-centered Christians love God, and when you love God, you serve people. You serve people. Now, I don't live in a bubble. Like, I get it, all right? I'm not tone deaf. I understand the season. I know what we just came out of. I know where we are right now. I really began to think about this. I'm like, what are we really saying here? You know, come on. It's, it's like, you know, I know the Word of God says, it, and, you know, come on, that should be enough, right? But for some people, I'm like, well, maybe they're like, tell me more about this, you know? <laughs> like, hey, guys, if you read something in here, you know, you want to become mature, just obey it, right? But, but I was reading this, and I was thinking to myself, all right, well, what are we really saying? You know, people have got kids, you know, people have got jobs, we got responsibilities, and if they all do sport, oh, my gosh, you know, like, we come on, I get it, I understand all about it. And I thought, well, before I stand up and say anything, right, maybe I should just research this message just a little bit more. So you know what I did? I read, and 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 I studied. And I tried to find out as much as I could about this. And you know what happened? I became more convinced after doing this message, after reading everything that I read, that it is actually a spiritual imperative that you serve in church. I became more convinced of that after reading everything that I read. And and get this, right? Are you ready? No, you're not ready for this, right? (laughs) Actually, arrange your priorities around it, which is really easy, by the way, when you have three services. (laughs) And midweek stuff. No, you should actually arrange your priorities around it. And there is a really, really good reason why I say this, because in all of these studies, this research, this huge research across the world, right? Hundreds of thousands of people, right? I, we, we discovered something. That serving is the most catalytic experience offered by the church. Across every single transition. So, so from people that are, are growing in Christ and, and, and maturing and, and developing and, and, and you know, going on to a deep and profound life that's Christ-centered, right? The thing that transitioned people more than anything else was actually serving. I know, right? Serving. I mean, if you thought watching was good, it's going to get so much better. 
It can get so much better if you serve. Serving is a catalyst for spiritual growth. And some people are like, come on now, where am I going to find the growth? It's standing on the street, or we'll just welcome someone at the door, right? Well, here's what we get. We get what's called organic growth. And organic growth means that when you start to serve, it's not about the act that you do, but it's about being in proximity to people, environments, facing challenges, going through things that you could avoid, of course, if you wanted to. But how many of you know and understand that it's those very experiences that shape you? It's the overcoming of challenges and other things that you go through. Yeah, when you serve, that actually helps to develop you as a person. Do you know that the top three activities that church can do, and I'm not talking about your attitudes or your beliefs, that's something separate. And I'm not actually even talking about your personal practices, that's something separate. But as far as the activities, and come on, Jesus commissioned the church, we believe in this. So here are the top three activities that will actually help you become a Christ-centered person, and I will list them in order. Number one, serving. Number two, services. Number three, being in a small group. There is a reason why we do these things. So let me ask you a question today. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? I want you to answer. Do you love Jesus? Yeah, but do you really love Him? Do you really love him? Because if you really love Jesus, then serving should be one of the highest priorities that you have. You know why? Because when you love God, you serve people. Now let me tell you something that happens when you begin to serve. Jesus will not love you anymore. You are saved by grace through faith In Christ, you, as you sit, are totally, utterly, completely loved by God. You are. Doesn't matter how you came in today. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your background, whatever it is. You are so loved by God. And you can't add anything to make Him love you more. Serving Him will not make Him love you more. He just loves you as you are. And you say, well, if that's true, shouldn't we be able to get away with it? Well, hang on now. Right? Because this is something that Jesus asked his disciples to do. This is how the kingdom of God advances across the earth. And this, I promise you, will absolutely grow you spiritually to become a Christ-centered person. It's all here. It's God's Word. It's what we've discovered when we look and we research and we find. It's all here. So what's my point? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Serving is a Christian essential. It just is. 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 Serving is a Christian essential. It's what we do. It's who we are. It's what we're meant to be about. We don't want to be spiritual consumers. We want to be spiritual contributors. We want to help wherever we can. And I, let me explain something that I think is really important. Really important. In this current season that we're in, Some of the research and stats are starting to come in across the Western church. And here's the truth. The church is very slow to come back to church. Right? This is this is just across the Western church. The church is slow to come back. I don't know if other priorities have crept in. I don't know if it's fear-based. I don't know. know. But the church is slow to come back. You know what's happening? People are they're rearranging their priorities, stepping back. The stats are in. People are stepping back from being involved and serving. And to me, that concerns me. Because I think that out of this season, we can either emerge as the church, a powerhouse that moves the world by the love of Jesus and helps and contributes and does something amazing. Or we can step back from the influence that we had and have even less of an impact and less of an impact on on, on our world, our neighbors, the people around us, right? And here's the great thing. We get to choose. No one's deciding for us. We get to decide whether we're going to close the gap between our attitudes, our beliefs, and our behaviors. And so what will you do? Well, I have no idea. 
I don't know. What are you good at? What are you good at? We'll find something. Yeah, we'll just make it up. I don't care. We'll make up a role. What are you good at? That's what we do. We do one of those things here. What is it? I don't know. We'll find something, right? But come on now. Like, I could not read everything that I read and not tell you that this is one of the most important things that not only you, but every church on the planet could begin to do in the season to come. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for every person that's in this room today. Lord, I pray that despite the challenges that we face, how we're prioritizing our lives, I just pray, God, that you would be at the center of who we are. God, give us the courage to arrange everything about you around you so that we're becoming more mature believers, yeah, actors, doers in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the reason that this message is just so critical, why I'd say this, is because there's a whole world out there of people who have no idea who Jesus is. And that's, that's, that's the huge part of the role that we play. If you're here today, and you're like, wow, this obviously must be really important. It is. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. The reason, part of the reason we exist, right, is to help you to navigate that new season. Yeah. God loves you so much that He gave His only Son. The Bible says, whoever believes in Him, that's, that's inclusive. Whoever believes in Him and what He's done, that you will never perish, but you will have eternal life. If you were here, you've never given your life to Jesus, but today you say, I want to make a decision to know Him and begin this journey that you talk about. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. So why don't we do this? Just give people a moment. If you close your eyes for just a moment. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus, but today you want to make a decision to follow Him. Whether you're sitting in here today or you're watching online and just watching this wherever you are, in your lounge room, on the train, doesn't matter where you are, but today you say, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus. It would be my great privilege and honor to lead you in a short prayer and help you do that. If you're here today, you want to give your life to Jesus, just raise your hand and say, that's me. I know I need to give my life to God. And after you do that, you can put your hand down again. But here, I want to pray. So why don't I begin to pray and you guys can just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you died on the cross for my sins. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. And I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and God gave God some praise. Come on.